Well, God bless everyone again. Welcome all of you. Good to have you here. Today I want to talk about something, again, that maybe you've heard many times, but I think it's a great refresher, great reminder for all of us to, to think about the price that we must pay as Christians. And this is something that sometimes, you know what, does not get, in my opinion, emphasized enough. That we sometimes hear many preachings or teachings on getting the promises and getting the benefits, but they never mention the price that is to be paid for us to follow Jesus. And this is something that, you know what, we need to remember and, and, and re constantly remind ourselves that Jesus gave it all for us. And the same way that he gave himself to us, we must also learn to give ourselves to others. And it's difficult because now it means that you need to sacrifice things. You need to give up things. You need to make changes in your life. You need to, in some ways, even let go of certain things that you would really enjoy doing. Just because you love Jesus more and you feel him drawing you to him so that you may follow after him and experience the transformation that comes just as the disciples experienced when they began to follow Jesus. How many have read, you know, obviously, you know, the Gospels and you've seen how Peter started, you know, he was very edgy, very, uh, you know, uh, tempered in his, you know, in emotions and so forth. It was hard for him to control himself. And yet by the time Jesus dies, he resurrects and the Holy Spirit comes upon him. He's a different Peter. He is preaching to 5,000 people, tell them to repent, to come to the Lord. You know, and he began to, to, to be part of, again, the, the founding fathers in that sense of the church. You know what? The, the disciples, the, the apostles laying foundation for all of us to be here today, right? So Jesus is the one that found the church. It's his church. But he chose these 12 men so that they could carry out the impossible. And that was to go to all the nations and preach to every creature. And the signs and the wonders follow them because they believed in their hearts. And they were willing to let go of everything. Including, you know what? Their jobs in so many different ways. Their careers. Their families. They paid a price to the point of death. And God, because of that, honors them and has honored them and, and honors all the people, all the Christians that in some way had to give up their life to, you know what, to preach the gospel or to simply keep the word of God safe so that today we would have, you know what, hundreds of translations into almost every language. And today we're sitting because of their sacrifice and what they were willing to, to give up for each and every one of us. Amen. So I want to read a few uh, verses for you. This is out of the book of uh, Matthew. And this is obviously Jesus speaking here. But I want to read a little more here. Um, I want to start from Matthew 16, verse 13. It says like this. This is when Peter confesses and realizes or has a revelation that Jesus truly is the Messiah, the one that was to come. It says like this. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? In other words... Jesus said, hey, what are people saying about me? Who do they say that I am? Are they able to, you know what, to recognize maybe, you know, who really you guys know now that I am? And if you think about that, when you begin to spread the gospel and begin to talk to people, unfortunately, most people will not have a right revelation of who Jesus Christ is. They only know that he is a savior and he died on the cross and that's as far as they go. Oh, they know that he's the son of God, but it's not a revelation that comes into their hearts that chan transforms them. It's just simply knowledge that does not change them in any way whatsoever. But the moment you have a revelation, that becomes part of you. And that's what we see here Peter having. And Jesus, you know, emphasizing this and confirming this. And it says like this. It says, so they say, some say that you are John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. And others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was the moment that he clicked for him. The Holy Spirit just brought this download onto him. And they realized, I'm dealing here. I'm having a conversation with the Son of God. One, one. And look what Jesus says. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, 
and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. What does that mean? That means that the revelation became that foundation, that, that stone, that, that thing that is unmovable, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah. It's not that Peter is the stone. In other words, he's not that, no. The, the revelation, Jesus Christ is that, that cornerstone that was, you know what, rejected. He is our foundation. He's our rock. And on that truth that He is the Son of God, all the church has been built. Now look at this. Look what it says afterwards. It says, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on this earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loose in heaven. Then he commanded the disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chiefs, priests, and scribes, and be killed, and even be raised on the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, says Lord, this shall not happen to you. So obviously, you know, Peter is coming concerned and saying, Hey, Jesus, you don't have to die. I don't want nothing to happen to you. He was thinking of himself. He says, I don't want to lose you, Jesus. You are my everything. But Jesus had the proper mindset thinking, No, I must die so that the whole world can be saved. If I stay here with you and... I be, you become in some way selfish and just trying to keep me to yourself, then I'm not going to do what I'm supposed to do, which is to die for all of humanity so that everyone could enjoy, you know what, life and life in abundance. And let me tell you, sometimes we are like this. We're thinking that Jesus is just for us. We want the blessings for us, but the whole world is waiting for us to take a step of faith and tell them that Jesus Christ is truly the Messiah and the Son of God. Okay? Let's keep going. It says, one second. Yes, so look at what it says. Then it says, 23, but, but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Now, imagine if you're talking to me and all of a sudden said, get behind me, Satan. You're like, well, are you calling me Satan? But that's exactly what's happening here. It says, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Right? Then Jesus said to the disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And what profits a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he will reward each one according to his works. As surely I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Amen. So I want you to see that on one end you see Peter wanting to keep Jesus to himself. Jesus was able to recognize that Satan was using him to uh, seduce him in a way or convince him to not have to go to the cross. In other words, they didn't have to take the hard way, but rather take the easy way out and just stay with the disciples and preach in a way. But Jesus recognizes, get behind me, Satan. And then says, you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. In other words, he was just looking out for himself. But when we put our minds in the things of God, believe me, the Holy Spirit begins to lead us. We begin to be concerned about, you know, what the things that matter to Him. Not all these material things that we think that we need. No, He already knows what we need. But He's looking for us to put our hearts and our minds on Him so that when He speaks to us, when He begins to lead us, we will discern His voice and be able to be led by the Holy Spirit to do exactly what what he wants us to do but there's a price to be paid and it says that whoever tries to save their life they will lose it what does that mean i mean of course you're thinking now of course if if we see danger coming we're gonna all try to run away and save our lives but it's not talking about that it's talking more about your soul and whoever loses their life because of my sake they will gain it talking about our souls meaning in other words we have come to a point in time that we have to make a decision. 
And this decision means that are we going to follow Jesus regardless of what happens in the world? Are we going to take a stand and follow Jesus and pay a price even if it means that if we're maybe ridiculed or mocked or maybe isolated or segregated or the whole society begins to mock Christians because of what we believe? Are we beginning to take a stand and know that me, we may lose some friends or even lose some, lose some family members and they begin to reject us in some way because we have decided to follow Jesus? And this is the kind of thing that Jesus was bringing to this. Look, if you really want to come after me, you must pick up your cross and follow me. That means that you must put every single day your desires, your dreams, the things that you want to do, put them on that cross and just follow me. In other words, leave everything behind. Let your heart be free from any attachment to this world so that when you follow me and ask you to do something, you will do it because you're not going to be looking back to what you left behind, but looking always forward that in me, in him, in Jesus, you will find everything you will ever need. Does that make sense? And the Lord is saying to these disciples here, look, you must let go of everything. If you're going to follow me, if you're going to put your hand in that plow like the verse tells us, make sure you don't go back. Make sure you don't do anything. Let's read another verse. Look at this one. This is... Um, We're going to look, uh, go to Luke 14, verse 28 to 33. It says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. When you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it. For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees will ridicule you. Saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose the king's about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able to, you know, with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples you know and sometimes people misunderstand this they think you know what well, they have to sell everything and you know they live under a, a tree or something and and just go wandering off like that and that's not what it's saying here but what it's saying is that we must have an understanding that if we choose to follow jesus it comes at a price if we choose to follow jesus you know what? Everything that he went through, the persecutions, the, you know, the spitting, the false, uh, you know, uh, witnesses accusing him. You know what? And people that he was with turning against him. That the same things that happened to him will happen to us. The Bible says that, you know what? They hated Jesus first. And for that same reason, they'll hate us. Why? Because we walk and we talk on the behalf of his name. We say Jesus. And the moment we say the name of Jesus we automatically come to a front of what light and darkness and the devil does not want us to say the name of jesus christ you know what they think is gonna there we go and uh what happens is that you know the enemy does not want us to say the name of jesus he does not want to talk about jesus and in fact when you hear the news and always a lot of times they mention the name of god but never the name of jesus and why is that because Jesus is the name above all names. Everyone can talk about God and have a perception of God. You know what? I can say, you know, God is wonderful. You can say, yeah, God is wonderful. You know what? God is great. You can say, yeah, God is great. You know what? God helped me yesterday because he took me out of my, the trouble that I was in. And you can say, yes, God is great. But the moment we begin to talk about what this guy looks like or what this God feels like or what he's able to do or his characteristics, we realize that we're not talking about the same God. You know what? A lot of people feel that God is some sort of energy or force or, you know what, or simply the power of the universe. But we know that's not true. We know that God has very specific qualities to him. He calls himself very specific names, such as the arm, the great I am, for example, you know? He calls himself in such a way that he distinctively, you know what, separates himself from any other possibility and he let us know who he really is. But if we're not clear on say, I follow Jesus, then people will not know exactly what God we're talking about. 
especially in this time that we're seeing you know what religions come together we're seeing you know what all these um, I guess uh, I call them Chrislam if you want to call it we're seeing Islam coming together with Christianity because you know what we all come from the same God in other ways that's what they believe that we're children of the same God because Abraham you know what he's the father of the nations and never had a Isaac and Ishmael right and obviously from Ishmael came all the Arabic and so forth and yet Isaac comes all the people of Israel right but that is not true when you understand that Allah calls himself in a very specific way you realize that he calls himself he describes himself as the destructor and a few other names that have nothing to do with what God calls himself right so this is why we must know the word and this is why that when we choose to follow Jesus you have to know this that persecution will come your way you have to know this that there will be a time that Jesus will say let go of your stuff and come and follow me in other words let go of this let go of that you know what stop hanging around these people stop doing this and come and follow me the Bible also tells us that whoever does not hate their mother and father is not worth of me in other words worthy of me what does that mean that means that we don't have to hate our parents no in other words we have to love God more than even our own families because at the end of the day salvation is individual you may be saved and your husband may not be saved you may be saved and your children may not be saved you may be you know what in a situation where you may be seeking God with all your heart and yet everyone else in your family may not be doing the same thing and that, that's why Jesus said that we will be rewarded based on what we do in this place but it comes at a price it comes at a price and even says, you know what, Jesus did not come to bring peace to this world, but rather the vision with a sword. To put a mother against his daughter, and a daughter against his mother, a father against his son, and so forth. Now why would that be? Because the moment you say, Jesus, you're drawing a line in the sand. The moment you say, I stand with Jesus, now you are not of the world. Now you have a common enemy, and that enemy is, of course, this world. If we are friends with this world, if we begin to love the things of this world, if we're more concerned about the things of this world, automatically we make ourselves enemies of God. Did you know that? We begin to fight God because we want what we see, we want what we think is best for us, and God says, let go of everything and pick up your cross and follow me. And this is the prize that we have to pay. We are living in a time that we're going to have to make choices. Difficult choices. Very hard choices. That will put us in a situation that we will have to make sure that we are, you know what, standing on the right side. And that side is called Jesus. The truth. Righteousness. There will be a time that will come and it's almost here that yes, we will have to leave things behind. There'll be a time that your own family will begin to seclude you. Your own friends will begin to cut you off. But the beautiful thing about all this is that we have been warned in advance. And that's why we have this great community here, great family, that we can come together and the Lord can use each and every one of us to meet our needs. The need for friends, the need for love, the need for companionship, the need for support, for encouragement, and even provision because it comes from the Lord and the Lord uses any channel He wants to channel His provisions into our lives. So you see, if we are not able to understand this, many of us, when the hard times come, will simply turn away from Jesus. If we're not able to stand on this truth that He is really the Son of God, then no matter what happens, that we will not betray Him. We will not, you know what, speak against Him. We will not deny Him because we're more concerned about pleasing people or what people may think or say of us. Then let me tell you, that is called paying a price. Like I said to you on the luncheon, I know that half the you know the congregation has been vaccinated the other one has not been vaccinated and whether you chose to be vaccinated you know what 
I believe that God led you to do that. And, and those that did not get vaccinated, God led you to do that. Whatever you feel was the proper thing, you do and follow what you feel is best for you. But we should not let that get in between us. And I want you to understand this. Because the society will pressure us to divide ourselves, those that are and those that are not. As a pastor, I cannot exclude the 50% of the congregation that have been vaccinated and the other 50 that have not. I have to find a way to get everyone together because we are still the family of Christ, the body of Christ. Do you understand that? And I want you to know this because the world right now is pushing and pressuring us to, you know what, to take a side. Are we for or are we against? And if you're not, then this will happen to you and so forth. But let me tell you, that's where the beautiful thing of God comes, that there's nothing impossible for God. Right? But we have to make a choice. Are we going to allow all these regulations to stop us from doing what we need to do? Are we going to stop, you know what, preaching God's word because, you know what, I'm, I'm afraid to approach someone that's been vaccinated? Of course not. Or am I afraid of the unvaccinated because, no, 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 don't play that game. I'm seriously. We trust in the Lord. The Lord is the one that protects us. The word is the one that guides us. And how can we reach those that may be in need in the near future? If we're not able to even come close to them. Or how can those, you know, reach those that they do not love or do not even have compassion for? In other words, the devil is trying to attack that area in our hearts so that we only look after ourselves and forget about what everybody else or what's happened with everybody else. And if we lose that, we lose our humanity, we lose our compassion, we lose the one thing that Jesus had for all of humanity is that regardless of what they were, whether they were sick, they were poor, they were sinners or not, he had compassion for them. He spent time with them. He reached out to them wherever they found themselves to be, whether it be with the drunkards or the prostitutes or whoever it was, he was right there with them, reaching them, knowing that, that they also mattered. And that's why I want to tell you this. Do not let this system, this society, dictate how you should behave or who you should love or who you should help. And that will be a price to pay. Why? Because now you will be looked up differently. Because you're not doing what everybody else is doing. What is everybody doing? Oh, no. You stay on your side. I stay on my side. No. You do things this way, I'll do it this way. And that's when we make a choice. And the choice is, do we stand firmly on what the Word of God says? Do we follow Jesus' example? Do we pick up our cross and put aside our logical thinking and begin to focus on what the Holy Spirit is saying to each and every one of us? And what is it saying? Love your neighbor. Love God above all things. Love one another. And just like he and the Father were one, he prays that we may also be one. And I want you to think about that for a moment because Jesus and the Father definitely were one. Whatever Jesus said is because the Father told him to say those things. He said, I only say and do what I see the Father do, what I hear the Father say. The same with us. Let it be that when we come together, we say the same things. We talk the same things. Our heart is in the same place. Not because we are one, but because we are one with the Father. So His thoughts will be in your heart. The things that matter to Him will begin to matter to you. So when we begin to talk to each other, what happens? We realize that we're talking the same things because we're thinking the same things because our source comes from above. Am I making sense? So we must be seeking God with all of our hearts. 
we must put aside all the things that keep us attached to this world. And I mean material things. Friends sometimes. And I'm, I'm not saying that we should, you know, abandon our friends. No. Put Jesus above anyone. And I know it's sad to say this, but, you know, of course, we don't want our family members to, you know, to go to hell. We don't want them to, to be lost, you know. We want everyone to be saved. But a time is coming that we will not be able to preach or share or talk about God in public. And now is the time to tell the world that Jesus loves it. Now, regardless of the consequences, now is the time for us to stand together and do what is right. Do what we need to do. Whatever that may look like. Turn off the, the stream, please. Turn off the stream. Go to uh, uh, Firefox and just put end stream. 